ladies and gentlemen, we're still in England, in the, in the West Midlands, but now we're in a place called Gaden in Warwickshire, which houses a most wonderful and amazing place. This is the, the, British, uh, the British National Motor Museum. So fundamentally, it's all British cars. They have a wonderful collection of Jaguars. We've just come into the foyer area, uh, I'm about to come into the foyer area, and what we've spied is something quite amazing, because this 1998 bright green Jaguar XKR uh, is actually from the James Bond film, Die Another Day, where it was used by the villain Zhao in a, in a famous chase, I believe, seen over the ice. You may note the... Re, the um, heavy machine gun mounted on the back. Clearly, if you're having problems with other drivers cutting you up on the road, the, having the sight of a heavy machine gun on the back of your car might act as a suitable deterrent. This vehicle is absolutely gorgeous. I have seen it before though, many years ago, because it used to live at the British National Motor Museum, which is located at, which is located at uh, at Bewley in the New Forest in Hampshire, England. Next to it is a gorgeous um, British Racing Green Daimler Sovereign with a plate indicating it is indeed a Sovereign. It looks like it's about to be driven elsewhere by a member of the, the team here. Uh, so a very, very good start to the day. I've just spied two other Jaguars in the distance in the, in the entrance area. And next uh, a modern XJ in a special commemorative livery and a, a beautiful gold historic uh, XK from the 1950s. Looking at that Let's go and have a look at them, Alan. Let's go and have a look at them. So, a couple of interesting Jaguars in the entrance to, this, to the storage centre, which is adjacent to the uh, British Motor Museum. Firstly, we're looking at a new shape Jaguar uh, X. J, uh, dating from 2012, in the Valley District of the UK, in a phenomenal special livery, which I think shows up the lines of the new shape XJ so very well. And talking about lines, next to it, by way of contrast, is a, 19, is a metallic gold, 1950s, originally from Sheffield in the West Yorkshire, it seems, uh, XK, an early model, looking by the narrowness of its grill, I would say, uh, 120 or 140. Absolutely gorgeous. The sort of thing a racing driver might have driven after he'd finished his racing at the circuit to visit his his model girlfriend in the 1950s in her luxury in her luxury Cheshire pad. Wow, we just heard a car start up. Next to it, it lo looks like an, an old Mark 9 or, or even older Jaguar, which is in the collection centre of the museum, which is only open to the public for special tours. This is a lovely looking vehicle. It uh, dates from the early 50s from London, mid 50s London. And there's clearly other Jaguars and deep objects of all sorts in the centre. From all been in storage and out the way of the public really. Yeah. So Jaguar yeah. had their own storage facilities, had all their cars there, so they were looking for somewhere to put uh, 
part of their collection. So they uh, put in a lot of money for this building. And then also upstairs is the British uh, car collection, um, where all of those really would have been around the back of the main museum and sheds, etc. So it was decided to uh, construct this. Um, Obviously, a lot of the money came from Jaguar Daimler, so uh, that helped to, uh, to build it. And also, a lot of the money came from the uh, National Lottery. And part of their conditions was to have uh, a group of volunteers, such as myself, to actually guide people around, undertake some restoration, do data collection, etc. etc. So that's why I'm here. So, as you can see, the uh, uh, Jaguar Damon collection, uh, just part of it really. Pretty much most of these cars will go, uh, and, and as you know, they're out to uh, various shows, etc. along the way. Um, as you say, there's a great man himself, Sir William, and his wife Greta. So it all started with Sir William, or William Hines as he was then, up in Blackpool. Um, he was a really big motorcycle enthusiast and several motorcycles. Um, also this type here, which is a rough superior, which is, you know, is a motorcycle which is uh, like the Rolls Royce of the uh, motorcycle world. Um, also on a rough superior, there's another chap on the name of William Wormsley here. And you can see them together. William Lloyd, William Wormsley, up in Blackpool. What he was doing at the time, he was actually making sidecars suitable for the motorcycles uh, in his back shed, in his back garden. And William Lyons, who was slightly younger than him, uh, eventually talked him into uh, going into business with him and making these sidecars uh, back in the 20s, you see. So as soon as William Lyons was 21 there, uh, they borrowed some money off the parents, as they, as they do these days, and then set, set up a business making these sidecars. The bank of mum and dad? Yeah, that's right, yeah. I think they had about 500 quid to set it all up, something like that. So it's quite successful, quite successful in fact. Um, so there's a picture of... Uh, several sidecars there, which are very simple in design, it's really a wooden frame really, with uh, aluminium panels, so quite simple and easy to make. Did quite well, so they moved uh, premises in Blackpool, and then William Lyons, who was the real sort of mover behind the business really, he wanted to get into making uh, cars. Um, so they started out really taking uh, an Austin 7 engine, chassis and running gear etc. Because they were plentiful at the time. Uh, lots of people were actually taking the same engine and chassis etc. And putting their own bodies on it. So that's exactly what they did. Um, an example of what? Here. We've got the name of the etc. So that's the Austin badge. They call it Austin Swire. So very simply, it's an Austin 7 engine and chassis, etc. But it's just got a Swire body. Made it relatively cheaply, so you know, it was available to the mass market. Similar one here, pretty much the same sort of car. So we say this one here, Walsley. Now Walsley's at the time were actually quite advanced in terms of their engines. Um, whereas the Austin 7 was like a side valve engine, four cylinder side valve engine. This was an overhead cam engine, you know, so for the time, in the 20s, it was quite good really. This one uh, to their heritage in this sort of state, which is really just a, an engine, a chassis and a tub, and that's about it. So they've taken it from that and they've 
restored it to that. At this sort of time as well, they actually uh, found that they couldn't get the, the staff, the workforce that they needed to actually go into making motor cars. Although they were skilled uh, in making bodies, they really wanted to up class it really and uh, get a, a better workforce. Um, although some of them were transferred down from Blackpool to Coventry, so that's where they ended up in Coventry. That's where a lot of the car manufacturers at that time were, were based. So they started out in a Fosal factory. That's a picture of the their lower right, they're all coming out on the on the bikes. Uh, in the suburb of uh, Coventry, as it was at the time. Also based in Coventry were a uh, firm called Standard Motor Cars. So they did a similar thing with Standard, they had a specific agreement with Standard, in that Standard would supply the engines, uh, but this time they would actually supply the chassis to the specification of Swallow. At this time then, we're calling it the SS. Nobody's really sure if it stands for standard, uh, standard. Swallow Standard, uh, Swallow Sidecars, Swallow Sports Cars, or what really, but it doesn't really matter. They changed the name then to, to SS. So this one was actually designed by William Wormsley, partner. Uh, because William Lyons at the time he was off with appendicitis. So William Lyons came back to work after his operation in recovery and uh, he said to William Walmsley, well I don't like it because it's too hard. He wanted to make a car a bit lower. So although well, it's still a very difficult car, you can see the two pictures of two SS there on the wall. The one at the top is the William Lyons version, which is slightly lower. And then the one at the bottom, which is this one here, is the William Walls version. So it's still a nice cat, isn't it? So as I say, this one's got the standard engine. It's got the ground on it because it uses the one to the Italian princess. One time. Sorry, in the way then. Okay. Uh, this is exactly the same really, it's a standard engine, the chassis made to uh, swallow specifications. Um, and again, these were sold in quite high numbers, marketed relatively cheaply, uh, and cost them really a few hundred pounds, which at the time was quite the way of money. Yeah, very well. Also, there's a similar one here. This is called an airline. Which is the one. Yeah, same again, standard engine in it. Is this an SS100? Uh, yeah, it's also called an SS100 because it's supposed to do 100 miles an hour. Yeah. About a 90 and a 100, so 
Same sort of thing, really. And it's an original, not a replica. <laughs> yeah, there's no replicas here. There's no replicas here. It's fantastic. I don't yeah, think I've seen an original yeah. one. So, uh, about this time then, 1939, along comes the Second World War. Uh, so production of any car ceases, and then everything goes into the war effort. So they're, they're still producing uh, sidecars, the uh, motorcycles. Uh, they're producing trailers, they're repairing parts for aircraft, etc. Their factory in Fosil. Um, so all the time they're thinking, well, this is going on. They're thinking, well, we haven't got an engine yet. We're, you know, car manufacturing, we're doing quite well. We don't have an engine. So all the time during the Second World War, they're thinking, well, we must develop an engine. So they do, they come out after the war with an engine and they call it an XK engine. We've got several engines over there, some of them are quite modern, but the one on the left there is an original XK. In that case it's four cylinders with overhead camshafts. They didn't really stick with four cylinders all uh, in the end. There's only like half a dozen made. The one next to it is the one the one they uh, made a lot of, which was a six cylinder in line, six cylinders in line, twin overhead camshafts. And that's what they stuck there, really. Um, when did they start? So this is. When did they make that? Right. 1948. 1945. Yeah. That's when they come up with this engine. At the same time, they don't want really to use the, the main SS anymore, okay, because uh, the connotations with the war. So that's when we turned the name to Jaguar, 1945. William Wormsley as well, at this sort of time, he goes out of the business, so it's just William Lyons on his own. They've just so, celebrated the 70th anniversary of the XK engine, haven't they? Uh, it's 70, 70 years old. Yeah, it would be something like that, yeah. yeah. It's, I'm trying to think how many years, it's 50 years of the XJ. That's right. Various anniversaries, yeah, yeah, about that sort of time. Even these saloons, there's a Mark 7 now, well we used to have a Mark 7 over there, but it's obviously gone out for some reason. But this big saloon here, that was also powered by an XK engine. And in fact it was quite successful at uh, rallying and uh, sports cars, racing, etc. You wouldn't think so, looking at that body, would you? But it was quite successful, so the engine was a good engine. Uh, they then started making, sort of going into racing, etc. So they started to develop a car here called an XK120. Because it's got an XK engine in it, 120 because it was supposed to go 120 miles an hour. This is uh, this XK uh, 120, well, in fact, this is a 140 actually. But it's got a split screen, split uh, wind screen, and a one piece bonnet. It's an XK engine. These were really primarily made for export. So, the first person to have one in America, that was the main time. Of the uh, film stars at the time there, uh, just after the war, they were all out there on the next day, the one twenty. In America. They did produce some themselves on here, but not many. Not many people after the war had the money for them. And uh, because there was a shortage of steel, the big push was for Exporting. Generated, yeah. Money, money. Because they're the ones with the money. And that's Clark Gable. That is, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Four legs of Jaguar Classics, where you just been. <coughs> so, probably now they just take all Jaguars now and completely restore them back to the original. So, so this, one, this one is a 140, which they didn't make that many of. It was an upgrade from the 120. Uh, didn't make that many of them. 
But if you ever look at the it's a uh, the 150. SK150. So this is the one that um, finished off the range, if you like. And all these ones now, so we've all got SK It's a bit wider, a bit bigger, a bit better brakes, better calling, etc. So it went for a bit more money. Uh, yeah, Thank you. 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 It's got the XK engine in it. Also, what most of them have would be disc brakes as well. One of the first cars to have disc brakes in, same as the XK. So Dunlop, uh, who developed the disc brakes with William Lines, they were in Coventry as well. So they got together, developed the disc brake. The disc brake then gave the car a distinct advantage when it was uh, in the Le Mans 24 hour and the other cars. So in 1953, a C type would win it. And then it also won in uh, subsequent years. Mainly with C types, but then actually also going into D types after that. So this fella, Malcolm Sayers, he designed the C type, the D type, and he also designed the E type. So then, of course, we've got the very famous E-Type. Again, uh, designed the original Series 1, designed by Malcolm Sayers. So again, XK engine in it. This one is one of the very first ones to be made. So at the time, the Jaguar driver by the name of Norman Dewis, he drove that from Coventry factory to Geneva, the motor show there, overnight in less than 12 hours in 1961. So in 1961, going from Coventry to Geneva in less than 12 hours was pretty good going, isn't it? No motorways or anything like that. We then went into the uh, Series 2, which you can tell straight away because the headlights are not uh, behind the, uh, the shroud. Yeah. They're very, very similar otherwise, really. Did they have problems with their shrouds? They... Yeah, the light coming from the headlight uh, was deflected too much, really. Oh. It diffused too much. That's why they went to the normal headlight as we know today. Yeah. So this has got better cooling twin fans, etc., better braking, uh, and probably more refined engine in it as well, Series 2. Uh, the one thing is you can tell, the louvers in the bonnet here, they, they've actually been cutting and welded in, so there's no deformation in the bonnet at all on this one. But with these, the sort of standard one, on the Series uh, 2, it's actually been pushed in as part of the uh, pressing process. So there's a bit of deformation in the bonnet there as compared to this one. So this one is a bit of a one off move. And then the back one is the Series 3. Of each. So this one has got the V, uh, V12 engine in it. So it's, we've gone from the uh, XK engine now to uh, a lightweight V12 engine. It's slightly different. It's the last one ever made. Yeah. The last eighty. Last eighty ever made. Wow. Yeah. That's the first one. 
pretty much the first one. Like the last one anyway. Wow. So was that the first production you tackled? The first people? Well, pre-production really, but they used it um, you know, as a basis model really. Is that the only surviving one? Yeah, pretty much. No. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the very last. That's the last one. The story with this one is that um, there's no reversing light on it, whereas the others have got reversing lights. The story goes that it uh, came to the end of the run, they ran, ran out of reversing lights. So rather than reorder 5,000 or whatever, they, they, uh, they made this one without reversing lights. <laughs> so the story goes anyway. All the time they're making these, or well, pretty much before these anyway, uh, they're making the saloon cars. So we've got uh, a Mark 1 there, again with an uh, XK engine in it, and a Mark 2, a famous Mark 2, where we've sold an awful lot of these, awful lot. Uh, the bank robber's car, <laughs> yes, aren't they? Really. <laughs> so if you get a 2.4, 3.4, 3.8 litre engines. They're all XK engines. Still quite a lot of them about, but uh, basically they're rock boxes, you know, so if you don't look after them, or if they're not restored properly, you can have all sorts of problems when you put a rock on them. The same with these lights, come to that. All of them. Yeah, yeah. Unless they've been restored, you know, properly. And then the S-Type, this one here, uh, when it came along after the Mark II, so this one would have a 3.4 engine in it, again, it's an uh, XK engine in it. That's the one the bank robbers loved, because it's got a bigger boot. The S-Type, bigger boot, it's also got independent rear suspension, where the Mark II doesn't have yeah. independent the rear suspension. They liked that model because they felt they could get a body into the boot <laughs> yeah. comfortably. Yeah, probably could. Yeah. Well, you can get a body in a Mark II. <laughs> I know they use that on the bank robbery, on the uh, train, great train robbery. Mm. They have one of those. Yeah. But you get plenty of loot in the boot. Yeah, yeah. Then, of course, uh, pretty much just before, just uh, after then, really, along come the, uh, the X, XJs. So that, that was the car, really, that um, William Morris... That William was. William Lyons wanted to end up with really. to have. So, on the wall there you can see that the uh, 50 years since the uh, X-Jay was introduced, and the various models there. So the Series 1, Series 2 and Series 3, they all had XK engines in, but then uh, after then about early 70s they went away from the uh, XK engine and started using um, 312s. The new type of So I didn't propose to go any more over these. And, uh, you know, you're welcome to come back and take photographs whenever you want, really. But I was just going to pop upstairs and have a look yeah. at the British collection. Yeah, That's all right. Yeah. Dry yeah. 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 But this, obviously, is not available to the public, really. There's a few in the uh, Coventry Museum. There's a section there. Yeah. And then we have the Saturday as well. Yeah. But uh, this is, in terms of the time, it has to be the best in the world. Yeah. In the, literally in the world. Yeah. I can't forget the space. Yeah. Uh, it, it's up to the sun. I can't believe it. Yeah. It's the best in the world. got a V8 in it. Um, 
Two and a half litre, I think it is. In pictures of the police. Yeah, the police used to have these as well. Um, it's all fiberglass. Yeah, and a separate chassis. Uh, with a V8 on the same. But uh, William Lawrence, about this time, that's when he bought Damien out. And uh, they did make it for a short while. Still calling it a Damer. But um, they didn't, uh, that finished it quite, quite early, really. So they didn't make money off them. I believe there's a Royal Land Rover. amazing uh, we've asked to see William Lyons car and they're actually taking it out of the garage so that we can go and view it absolutely amazing we'll see you in a minute Stillgate and in Warwickshire in the United Kingdom what a treat they've taken this XJ6 special out of the workshop uh, in order for us to film it now now you may think what is so different about this 19 very early 1968 XJ6 which, with a Coventry registration, even though it's in a nice chocolate brown car. Well, I'll tell you what's different. This car was actually owned by Sir William Lyons, the famous power behind Jaguar. I think it may have been his last car, but it was certainly absolutely uh, the epitome of the early XJ. And to have actually photographed uh, Sir William behind the wheel of this car would have been a treat. But here we are, resplendent in the English sun on Monday, July the 2nd, 2018. One of the earliest XJs and one personally owned and run by Sir William Lyons, the founder of Jaguar in old age. How absolutely sweet. They actually took it out the workshop for us, didn't they? They did indeed. They were Very repairing it did. or just servicing it. It had been serviced. I understand it had been displayed as a show at the weekend somewhere and, and coming just for a, for a minor service. But uh, they kindly have brought it out into the sunshine on this fine summer's day to show us a car, an XJ like no other, an XJ owned by the man behind. Jaguar itself. And that building behind Alan, what is that? This is the storage centre. This isn't the main museum. This is just where they store a few cars, a few cars, 350 vehicles. But on the ground floor, there are 50 of some of the most historic and unusual Jaguars in the world. And we rare and unique concept cars. A car which was used as an XJ, which was used as a fire engine, as a racetrack. Daimler limousine that had been owned by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, an XJS that had been owned by Princess Diana. So we've been in there, haven't we? And we've got we lots have. of uh, plenty of videos we want to look at. Plenty of videos. This is, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know where you're watching this video from. But if you are a true Jaguar enthusiast and you find yourself one day in the United Kingdom, make a note: of the British Motor Museum in Gaydon, in Warwickshire, in the West Midlands of England. Quite simply, full of the rules in this entire world. Including the first E type and the last E type? The first, uh, the first production open top E type and the very last E type, two cars away from each other, including first various other first and last. And we're including the XJ220 concept car. So if you want to subscribe to uh, Peter Happer's web YouTube channel, you'll see the films when they come out. This is a remarkable place, and to my mind better than the, the 
than the UK's National Motor Museum in Bewley in Hampshire, although a little further from London. 